Okay, if you could please be seated and we'll get cracking now with session two of the Forum for the Future of Agriculture. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you enjoyed your coffee break. And welcome to session two on how to build a more resilient and sustainable food and agriculture system. What have we learned from the energy crisis that enables us to overcome the challenges and exploit the opportunities? Very warm welcome to all of you as well who are joining us online this afternoon. My name is Rosa Donovan, and I will be moderating this session and the next one, which will run until around lunchtime. As we said earlier, we aim to make this forum as interactive as possible, and there will be an opportunity later for participants to ask questions. We have roving microphones available here in the square, and anyone who wants to ask a question online can do so under the chat box that appears under your screen. Feel free as well to follow the forum on Twitter at Forum for Ag. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're a little bit off time, but we will get cracking now in our first panel debate. So please allow me to introduce my distinguished guests. To my immediate right, I have Catherine Gisla-Laniel, who is the Director in Charge of Strategy and Policy Analysis in the Commission's Director General for Agriculture and Rural Development since January 1st. From September 1st, 2020 until December 31st, 2020, she was Director at the General Secretariat of the Council, responsible for veterinary and plant health questions, food and forestry. Prior to that, she was Executive Director at the European Food Safety Authority based in Parma. Many might say that Catherine is now now very well placed to climb the ranks even higher to the top echelons of DG Agri. Perhaps it's high time, Catherine, that we see a woman in that top job in the directorate. <laughs> Next, we have Shari Roga Fiddler, who is president and CEO of the Chicago-based Farm Foundation, which was the first US institute, ag institute set up in the 1930s and one of the forum's international partners. Shari, who has 25 years of global leadership and executive experience, describes the US Farm Foundation as a think tank and a do thank, which is nonpartisan and non-lobby. She is also a fifth generation uh, excuse me, farm owner and operator, an entrepreneur in the organic branded food industry and founder of an agribusiness consulting firm. I also understand that Shari keeps her grandma's bell jar filled with earth from her family farm in Nebraska to remind her of her farming roots. Then we have Professor Tim Benton, who leads the Environment and Society program at Chatham House. He joined Chatham House back in 2016 as a distinguished visiting fellow, at which time he was also Dean of Strategic Research Initiatives at the University of Leeds. As a leading advocate on food systems transformation, he has worked with many governments, the G20 and the UN, as well as leading businesses and civil society organizations. Tim has also published more than 200 academic papers, many tackling how food systems respond to environmental change. And last, but by no means least, to my uh, most extreme right, I would like to welcome Eva Weber, who is a farmer and landowner from Sweden. Eva studied economics at Lund University and international trade at the University of Santa Barbara. Following a stint in Stockholm in broadcasting and the streaming industry, she returned to the countryside, studied agriculture and became a farmer, which she describes as the best decision she ever made. Maybe more on that later, Eva. She is now sixth generation farmer of a 400 hectare holding, engaged in science-based agriculture while also working part-time as secretary at the Swedish landowners organization. So please, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to my panelists. So now for the order of play, first we're going to have a brief four to five minute opening introductory remarks from each of my distinguished panelists. There is a countdown, in uh, countdown clock in front of you, so please keep a close eye on that. This will be followed by a short Q&A session between the speakers and I. And then at around 11.45, there will be an opportunity for you, the audience, to ask questions. We aim to continue the Q&A session until around noon or a few minutes afterwards, and that will be followed immediately by another panel discussion by yours truly. So Catherine, let's start with you. I would invite you to take the floor to deliver your introductory comments. And when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I hope that you can hear me well. Um, so what we've heard um, this morning is um, that there is an emergency and we need to take action. Personally, I would put it um, 
as follows. Uh, we've been in Europe very good at delivering food security for EU citizens. Um, this is important to celebrate that. But this is also important at the same time to recognize that this has been done at the expense of environment and climate, and that this is time uh, to take action. Um, as policymakers, I think we have a role to play. And of course, we are not working in isolation, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but we have a role to play. First of all, I think that we need to set the direction this has been done, I think, very well and very clearly with the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy, where we have identified a couple of objectives and the need to transform our food systems. And it's not just about agriculture. This includes agriculture, but this needs a, a systemic change of the whole food system. As policymakers, also, we need to support all the key stakeholders, we need to support you um, and in particular help you to invest in the right direction. So I think it's important to say that this is not just about legislating, it's also about providing financial support that helps uh, um, farmers, food processors and all the economic players of the food chain to invest uh, in what will help to deliver more sustainable food. And here we have a couple of um, funds um, that are part of the common agricultural policy, as we called it in the past, the second pillar, but not only the CAP, also the uh, recovery fund, invest EU fund, and maybe we will need more in the future because we know that investing in our food systems is essential. What we need also is to incentivize our farmers to develop practices which are um, more environmental friendly, which are restoring, you know, health, healthy soils, uh, which helps to protect our water, our environment, as well as, um, of course, to produce uh, food. So basically here, I can say that the common agricultural policy is an enabler in that context to help incentivize farmers to adopt better practices. And with the new cap, with the eco schemes, I think we are in the right direction. There are already millions of farmers in the EU. And maybe we need to say it, millions of farmers already in the EU and all over the world who are implementing sustainable agricultural practices. We mentioned regenerative agriculture, but we also have agroecology, we have conservation agriculture, we have organic agriculture. So all these practices need to be enhanced and scaled up. And that's where maybe when it comes to scaling up, we have some difficulties. As policymakers, we can see that solutions are there more sustainable practices, more agronomy, more nature-based solutions, technology, innovation are there, but how can we help farmers to use them more and to be, you know, to sort of massify also the use of these practices? So that's why here I'm happy to be with you today, because I'd like also to hear from you what we need to do differently better, more, what we should stop doing so that we are able to scale up this transformation of our uh, practices. And in particular here, I'm talking about farming practices. Um, it is important to say that the transformation that we are talking about is not just about agriculture. And I have heard many here referring to farmers, which is important, of course. But we need to produce differently. We need to produce also different type of food and, and crops. So that's important that we, um, that across the food chain, you know, uh, all the key players, the food industry, um, the retailers, everybody is also, you know, participating and working on uh, this transformation. So I think it's a collective work. That's why also it makes it a bit 
complicated because we need to work together. If I start to crop different crops, I need to be able as a farm, farmer to find somebody to buy these crops, you know. So that's very important. So let's work together and the collective work is very important. Um, so let me say that um, I am not pessimistic or not frustrating, the word has been uh, mentioned, because I can observe already that millions of farmers have changed their practices and that, you know, the key economic uh, stakeholders of the food chain have started to work. But I see that the sense of emergency sometimes is not sufficient and that we should accelerate the transformation. And that's why also I'm happy to be with you today to see how we can, as policymakers, work with you to further accelerate this transformation. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> You covered a lot of ground there, Katrina. We'll be coming back to some of those points that you raised in a moment. So, Shari, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Rose. And thank you for the invitation to be here today. I want to begin by saying I am optimistic about the future, both as CEO of Farm Foundation, but especially as a farmer and entrepreneur. And the reason is, I think, in order to fix tomorrow today, I think what we need is radical domestic and global collaboration that is multi-stakeholder. And I'd like to share three of those ways in my short remarks now. The first thing I think we need is a policy environment that enables rather than inhibits progress. And I think out of the three areas I'll be sharing, this is probably the key challenge um, and the key challenge ahead for us, although I was more optimistic after speaking with Katarina this morning. But I think what we've seen in the U.S. side of things is historic uh, levels of investment again and again and again, um, both during the pandemic with spending and then as well with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. And I think there's a lot of focus on the Inflation Reduction Act, but really that spending is dwarfed by the infrastructure bill spending of $1.2 trillion. And then followed by that, we're just coming up to the renewal of the farm bill process in the US. So I think right now in the US, we're looking at all of that spending across all of these initiatives and the impact that that will have. But I think, as I mentioned, between the EU and the US, I think we have to have ongoing dialogue to better understand the gaps and opportunities in our approaches to the policy environment. The second level is I think we need robust markets that enable change. And I think there's lots of great examples around the globe in terms of companies that are doing that, global companies, whether it's um, PepsiCo or General Mills, but also at the ground level um, in rural communities, lots of innovation going on there to address these issues. Farm Foundation just hosted a forum called the Greening of the Fertilizer Industry. I encourage you to look at our website there if I don't get to talk about that today for some great examples. The third area I think we need is uh, we need to empower farmers to do what they do best, and that is to continue to innovate, to feed and clothe the world. And there again are so many great examples of innovation that is going on at the farm level to try to tackle the, the needs of the future. And we said today that it's about saving humans. I think we have to ensure that farmers are core to that. We depend on for farmers to save humans. And we in our own farm family are doing all that we can to fix tomorrow today for our next generation on our farm as well. I'm excited about the future also partly because of our new collaboration with the Forum on the Future of Agriculture, the Australian Farm Institute, and the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute. These kind of global collaborations and dialogues, especially as I mentioned on the policy level, I think that's where a lot of the ongoing dialogue needs to occur to try to to, to better understand how we can approach the future. Farm Foundation's mission is to build trust and understanding at the intersection of ag and society, and I think that's what our new collaboration with um, the Forum on the Future of Ag is all about, is building that better understanding of the gaps and opportunities ahead. So I think I'll, I'll give you back a few more minutes, Rose, actually. Okay, that's kind of you, Shari. Thank you very much. And thanks for being succinct in your points there. And as you say, you wear two hats here today as a farmer and also as president of the Farm Foundation. And thanks for mentioning as well the Global Forum on Farm Policy and Innovation, this new initiative um, that you just outlined. We'll come back to that in a moment, Shari, okay? So, Tim, whenever you're ready now, your five minutes, uh, the clock is on. 
Thank you very much and good morning everybody. It's always nice to be back in this building. Um, we heard today quite powerfully from Janusz and Franz about the failures of the food system and 2022 I think it's writ large that the interaction between geopolitics, the war in Ukraine, uh, the uh, increased international tensions, climate change and post-Covid shows that to a certain extent the food system works if you're part of the world's rich whether it's within a country or, or between countries. And from my perspective, this unsustainability and irresilience of our food system is a problem with the market incentives. They do not reward sufficiently either sustainability or resilience. And part of this problem is that certainly from a food security perspective, governments often think it's a market problem to solve. And the market often thinks it's a government problem to solve because if there's enough crisis, government will step in to intervene. So there's a bit of a, particularly around food price spikes, there's a bit of a tension there between those two different views. And certainly if you think, we, we often talk in this forum about efficiency and we talk about efficiency of agricultural production. But when it comes to the efficiency of the food system, so calories produced, protein produced, nutrients produced that we can eat and they contribute to a healthy, sustainable diet, the efficiency of the system is dreadful because we lose so much and we convert so much to other things that are not, not directly relevant from a human health or planetary health perspective. And if you think about the properties of a resilient food system, redundancy, modularity, not centrality, diversity, flexibility, agility, etc. Often those have been stripped out because they're not economically incentivized within the system. So it's often not profitable for the food system to drive market solutions that are sustainable, that are nutrition providing, that are resilient. So in my mind, one of the big elephants in the room is that solutions lie in the restructuring of markets and making it profitable to produce food that is different from a nutrition and planetary and resilience perspective. And that requires different forms of regulation. I wouldn't say more regulation, it requires different forms of regulation. It needs a systemic approach that covers trade, it covers production obviously, repurposing of subsidies we often talk about, taxes in the right place, incentives in the right place, on both, as, as was said earlier, the demand and the supply side, to make the availability better of the sorts of things that enhance people's diets and are sustainably produced, reducing their price and making the availability worse of things that do the opposite. And we know from 2022 that events happen that can force a political window to open. And if you just think about the way that within the EU, we have that now started to intervene in restructuring energy markets for the public goods perspective, we can do the same from a food perspective. It's not just about agricultural regulation. It is also about the whole package of things on supply and demand side. And of course, farmers need to be brought along. Many of my farmer colleagues are very much bought into this, but citizens also need to be brought along um, as, of course, it will change the availability and price of some foods. So we can we can absolutely build public goods into markets and internalize what is currently external. And I was told when my first day as a civil servant that it was the job of governments to intervene when there is market failure. That's their social license. And we have market failure writ big within the food system through the externalization of costs. And it also requ requires incumbent power to be receptive to change and not standing in the way. And of course, that means embracing profit with a purpose and an intergenerational purpose, not just the purpose of raising funds for shareholders. And of course, that takes leadership. And this is a good place to talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thanks very much for that. And as I say, yes, this geopolitical earthquake that you sort of ally uh, referred to there and sort of this realignment of geopolitical alliances that Shari touched on. Let, let's, let's go into more detail, as I say, later on during the course of the conversation. So, Eva, 
the floor is yours. Uh, from this, from the farmer's perspective, so you returned to farming after um, a career in the non-farming sector. So we're looking forward to hearing about your experience and uh, I suppose your main message today for policymakers, stakeholders, and your peers. Go ahead, Eva. Hi, everyone. My colleagues and I work hands on fixing tomorrow today every day. I am here because I'm an entrepreneur. I work with green asset management. I'm a farmer and I'm proud over it. <clears throat> Me and my two sisters are the sixth generation farmers on our farm. We work with science-based agriculture on 400 hectares, mainly producing wheat, rapeseed and alfalfa. Sadly enough, we don't have any employees and we have other jobs on the side. Farmers are friends of Mother Earth. She is the basis of our existence. To create good conditions for the next generation is in our veins. My view is that we don't inherit the land from our parents, we manage it for our children. Every day I work with the photosynthesis. It means that our plants binds tons of carbon dioxide and I produce food, energy and oxygen. That's photosynthesis. So please work with me, not against me. Farmers can contribute even more to a sustainable world. We are part of the solution to fossil free energy. But we need financial incentives. So we can shape profitable and healthy businesses that can invest in new technology, technology that can make us even more efficient in everything we do. Frustrating but reality as a farmer is our complex situation. With too many rules and legislations that affect us negatively and takes too much time from value creating activities and cost too much money, money that could be a lot more effectively used. I feel a big sense of urgency. The transformation is not gonna happen by itself. Let's go from discussing and talking and start acting. Give us farmers the tools so we together can fix tomorrow today. So, Mr. Franz Timmerman, I agree. Give us at farm level increased profitability, long-term commitment and less legislations. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Eva, for that very clear, precise and impassioned plea there on behalf of your family, your sisters and the farming community. Can I just ask, uh, you say that it's a, one, a 400 hectare farm, which is very impressive, ran on a science based approach to agriculture. Maybe just dig down a little bit. What do you mean by that and how does that work in practice, Eva? I mean that we use the best um, knowledge to produce food in a most sustainable way um, with the best technique that we can afford. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. So we use uh, crop rotation, uh, we use um, um, less, uh, we try to use um, the technique to be more effective with everything we do, yes. Um, so keeping the environment central to your, your production methods there, Eva. Exactly, okay. thank you. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Catherine, I'm going to turn to you now. You said at the top of the session that you're not pessimistic and you're not frustrated. Um, keeping in mind the theme of this session, what are the key lessons that we learned from the energy crisis that we are sort of currently enduring at the moment on the basis as a result of the war in Ukraine and perhaps even before Russia invaded the, the sovereign state of Ukraine? What sort of lessons have we learned, say, in Europe in terms of dealing with that? Uh, Franz Timmermans mentioned, obviously, the growth in renewals and I suppose shifting our focus, shifting the narrative there. So maybe just from a DG Agri perspective, What's your take on that? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's good to look at um, the, the last uh, years and, 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 and what we've, we've been experiencing both with, uh, with the pandemic as well as with the uh, impact of uh, the war in Ukraine and to see that um, um, we've, we've learned, first of all, I think that uh, food security is, is very important. Uh, we've seen that in some region of the world, um, they have been struggling uh, with this during the pandemic. And so that's uh, part of our, now we use this word sovereignty or our open strategy autonomy. That's very important. So we need like energy, food, health, you know, uh, are, are critical to our sovereignty. We've also learned that uh, our food supply chain has been um, resilient. Uh, I think it's important to say it, though not everything was easy and perfect, but uh, we shall pay tribute to our uh, food supply chain. We've also, I guess, uh, identified uh, some risk and vulnerabilities during this, uh, these two um, major crises. I would say some of our dependence um, that needs to be fixed, meaning not that there is a solution to everything, but at least being aware and see whether we can do a better job when it comes, for example, to the dependence to uh, chemical inputs, um, dependence to fertilizers, obviously, um, which uh, is critical in the context where we know that, you know, um, Russia in particular is a major producer of fertilizers. So we need to see how we can uh, um, do a better jo job there. Dependence to fossil fuel energy. Uh, of course, this is not just for the farming sector and the food supply chain, but this is for uh, the whole economy. And we see that we are, uh, we've been making progress uh, here. So dependence also to um, uh, import of feed um, that has produced, um, of course, that has helped us to build, you know, um, the meat industry we know, but uh, there are drawbacks also here. The dependence to imports might be problematic. And here I'm not talking about, you know, um, I think it's very important that we remain an open economy, but this is important to see how we can do a better job because this is good for not just the environment, this is also good for our economy and the profitability of our farming sectors. Okay, hey, Catherine, and as you said, that sort of over-reliance on maybe a, a, a smaller number of countries has maybe come back to bite us here in the European Union. Shari, if I could turn to you, you spoke of radical and global collaborations. Um, is this in terms of scientific endeavor? It's, it's the bigger picture here on climate change, but what do you mean exactly? And how is maybe the farm, um, your organization taking that, the farm foundation taking that forward, Shari? Sure, so for radical collaboration across stakeholders, just a few examples. The tsunami of money that is coming out in the US really is gonna be executed through public institutions and the private sector. So some of it is that kind of collaboration that needs to happen. We've talked about elephants in the room. Well, this is like digesting an elephant, basically, to have this tsunami of money coming in. And to implement it, it's actually a significant challenge. Uh, the NRCS, the conservation organization in the US, said that they need to hire 3,000 new people just to implement some of these initiatives. Um, and I 
neglected to call out the labor challenge in my opening remarks, which I think is a key challenge, both at the farm level and at the government level. But these collaborations are important in order to implement this money. Money is not just the solution. In order to implement it, we do need to have that collaboration in the public-private partnerships, and then importantly, at the global level, um, as I mentioned. So again, excited to be here and to look forward to more collaboration opportunities. And going back then, I mean, you're referring here to the Inflation Reduction Act, and if I've, I've done my homework correctly, there's about what, 391 billion allocated to spending on energy and climate change alone. It's been described as the biggest industrial strategy for the country since the Second World War. But how will that trickle down to farmers? And in real terms, you know, how will that trickle down from this federal reserve, the federal budget, down to farmers on the ground? I would say it's not clear yet, and I think, again, the opportunity that's coming up in the U.S. with the renegotiation of the Farm Bill right now is that we're looking at how the different spending will be harmonized with the Farm Bill and how, how it can reach the farm level. So I, I think the jury is still out, actually, and I think there is work to be done in the new Farm Bill to try to help clarify how it can reach the farm level. And remind myself and the audience members, where are we with the Farm Bill in terms of the review of the Farm Bill? Uh, is this due for the end of this year? How does it work in the legislative process in the US? It is due this year, and then there's lots of talk about will we achieve it this year. I think the common conventional wisdom or knowledge is that we may not achieve it this year. It may roll into next year partly because of the complexity of this harmonization of all the money, as well as the politics involved, which uh, we haven't touched on, but that is core to that process as well. Okay. Well, Catherine, now that you're here with me, and as a journalist, you, you've piqued my interest in your work as a strategist, in your new job as a strategist. Can I ask you, um, is it time to overhaul the common agricultural policy, to create a European food policy, or to just to rejig the nature of this mammoth European common agricultural policy? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, I don't know whether we need a, a revolution, but I would say that we need to um, continue to strategically think how, you know, um, the common agricultural policy can play a bigger role in, you know, uh, supporting farmers um, on this journey to sustainability, that for sure. And I think the current cap, uh, the one that we have started to implement as of the 1st of January, is already providing, you know, good tools and instruments. Um, should we do more? I would say probably. And that's what we are going to start to think about in the coming months. Maybe it's also time to see how the cap, um, maybe to step back also and to look at all the um, the, 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 the policy mix that we have, because it's about the cap, but not just the cap. I think, as I said, it's about also investment. It's also about how we support farmers. We didn't mention that, uh, but I think there is something which is also very important in terms of providing vocational training advice to farmers. Uh, I don't think they are reluctant to change, but they need also to uh, be supported uh, from a technical point of view. We need also to see how we can um, use tools to de-risk the transition, because changing your farming system means that you are taking risks. Mm -hmm. So you need also to be helped in that uh, in, in with this so and and then legislation can pay, play a role uh, but we need also to find the right balance between these different uh, policy tools sure thank you Catherine Tim I'm going to turn to you now you're described as a leading advocate on food systems transformation which is really the crux of the issue here today so where are we going wrong where are we going right is more so, so. So if you think about what Janusz and Franz was talking about this morning, we have pollution, we have uh, biodiversity loss, we have soil problems, we have climate change, and we have the situation where more people are killed each year and are sick each year because of poor diets, rich world and poor world, than due to any other cause. So whichever place you look, if you join up the thinking on health, sustainability, climate, farmer livelihoods, uh, consumption um, uh, for a nutritious diet. 
it leads you to, to a solution space that is very different from saying, we've built a system over the last 60 years that is really based around the intensification of a smaller and smaller number of products that are produced in enormous quantities at enormous cost to, to people and to the planet. So it's about how do you bring into alignment all of these things. So just from, I don't, don't mention the, the B word Brexit, but in a UK situation, our farm economy is 10 billion pounds. The direct costs of pollution are about 5 billion pounds. The indirect costs of climate change from the farm sector are about 5 billion pounds. And the ill health costs that come from eating poor diets is somewhere between 30 and 50 billion pounds. So if you take a whole of society approach to that accounting, you would pay farmers to farm in a different way to grow different things and make them more profitable, produce more food more sustainably and produce food that was more dietary relevant and more health enhancing and reduce the healthcare bills. So it's a matter of getting all of these things into alignment. And unfortunately, most governments are not set up to join health and environment and farming and uh, trade and the National Finance Ministry, et cetera, to create a structure that deals with the systemic challenges of today. You touched upon it there, but how does trade fit into that bigger picture when the multilateral system is currently in a state of disrepair? <laughs> what a great question. Um, I mean, this is partly why I now work at an international affairs institute, Chatham House. Um, the, no country has sovereignty over its food system because of most, almost every country in the world, one, perhaps North Korea is an exception, will eat food that is imported as well as export food and eat for food that is locally grown. So that creates a huge policy paralysis and a disincentive, first move a disincentive for a government to go gung-ho towards saying we're going to transform our food system because under WTO rules and under trade agreements you always risk being undercut by importing food of lower environmental quality that is cheaper and that's been prominent in the, in the Brexit debate back in the UK. So what we need is countries to align together to create change in steps so you're not risking undercutting yourself when you move. And that's why we need the multilateral architecture to work just at the time where the tensions that come from food insecurity, energy insecurity, critical mineral insecurity, geopolitical tensions, trade wars, wars, conflict, migration, are making the multilateral architecture really creak at the seams. So thank God for Europe, because at least you've got a federated multilateral institution that sometimes feels as though it doesn't work, but you're in a much better place than somewhere like the UK, where we've just cut ourselves off from the necessary architecture of cooperation that we need. Mm, thanks for that, Tim. If I can go to Eva now at the end of the panel. Um, let's talk about opportunities. Opportunities at, at, at your own level at the farm, within the Swedish landowners organization, within Sweden more generally. Opportunities to be had, to be exploited as a result of perhaps the situation that we find ourselves in, um, in terms of energy or energy supply, etc. What sort of opportunities do you see from the perspective of farmer stroke landowner, Eva? Yeah, well, I, um, from a, a farmer and my own perspective, I see a big potential because farming land is the only thing that is not being made anymore. Um, and farming and forestry is binding carbon dioxide. And the more we produce, the more we bind. And, um, and if we, uh, the energy we produce, and if we use that instead of using the fossil fuel, we don't add any new carbon atoms into the system. So I think we have to find a way to profit farms on storaging of carbon. Uh, and I also think that the energy production, it has to go to the farms. So we can um, produce grassland and other energy crops and make bioenergy. And where is your farm located in Sweden? Is it, is it a largely forestry, for example, or is it, is it mostly arable? Oh, it's uh, in my area, it's only arable. Only arable, yeah. okay. 
because yeah. of course you come from a country that's quite famous for its uh, afforestated land. Okay, well thank you Ava for that. Now ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're sort of bang on time again, so I'm going to open it up to the floor. I have a question right here, second row, if I can get a roving microphone to this lady here with uh, the nice colourful scarf. And then we'll go to you, just one moment, okay? Just uh, bear with me, we'll just get a hostess up here now, this lady here with the scarf. Yeah, if you perhaps just introduce yourself and say to whom mm -hmm. the question is addressed and um, just I would encourage you to keep your question short and sweet if you don't mind. Thank you. Uh, just a mic. Get a mic over here. Hello. That's, that's working. It's working. Okay. Uh, my name is Anna-Sophie Gambo. I'm a Danish farmer. Uh, I think uh, first I would like to thank everybody for coming together here in Brussels. I think it's so helpful for us farmers to get a little perspective of what we're doing every day. I think I might be posing this question to Catherine because um, we, I, I represent Danish farmers. We are ready, we are willing, we are able. We really can do the change, but we need the incentives to do it. The incentives to, if you want us to produce food, will produce food. If you want us to produce energy, we'll produce energy. If you want to pr us to produce ecosystem services, we will do that. I would make an example. If we want to do conservation agriculture, we, we, we think that I think the future is in the soil. I, I think we all think that. So we really want to do this if it's possible. But to make the transition, how can we trust the legislative work to be um, making it sure for us. I'm a little afraid that if I do that in my very clay soils, I need to spray more. Is that the right way to go for me? Can we all agree? Let's go do it, but we need a little more spraying. No, we can't agree. So we need somebody to help us. We can't solve everything everywhere at the same time. Some people can solve some issues, some other people can solve other issues. But we've got to be allowed and we've got to be able to trust the legislative and the science. We also don't trust the scientists. They are often have a political agenda. So it's very, very difficult to be us, but please be aware we are ready, able and willing. Mm. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, sorry, just to that lady, Anne Sophie, if you don't mind passing the microphone to the gentleman, and then, uh, but first, Catherine might respond to that uh, statement and uh, just the statement that the lady made from the Danish farm um, organization. So, Catherine, do you want to take the floor yeah. and respond? Um, yeah, that was not really a question. I, 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 I've heard. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. Well, that I cannot answer. I mean, we do our best uh, to be trusted, but uh, as you know, this is not a decision. You are the only one to, to make the decision. I think where you, where, what, what is important in what you said is, first of all, you said we are willing, we are ready, uh, you know, to embrace the changes and so on. So that's the beginning of action, I think. You know, awareness and being ready to change is, is important. Um, we have a, a policy, uh, an important policy in Europe, and I think we can say that we are lucky to have that, which is the Common Agricultural Policy, uh, which uh, is, is supporting farmers um, here where you can help us also maybe uh, to do a better job is to make sure that this policy is helping you to change and to move into the right direction. So. Um, with the eco schemes, um, we've made, uh, you know, I think we can make together um, a better job uh, when it comes to farming, sustainable farming. Uh, what can we do more and better to support you? I gave some indication. I think we need also maybe to look at how we can de-risk better the transition. I'm not sure that yet the policy is, 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 is working, you know, um, very hard on this. Um, how can we also make sure that um, uh, we send uh, clear signals also to the role of livestock? Um, I think that uh, the society is also asking us, you know, is there a role for livestock in a sustainable farming system? So here, what kind of, of, of livestock? So these are questions that we are going to ask ourselves and, and on which we are going to work in the coming months to see how we can, you know, 
adjust, um, adapt the current common agricultural policy to make it fit for purpose. Okay. Yeah. Having said that, I need to say that there is not um, one size fits all solution. I think that also that the answer to sustainability is in the diversity of farming. And that's what's making it also a bit more complicated maybe than what we used to call the green revolution, which was more, you know, a, a selection of simple recipes, uh, which were almost applicable uh, wherever you were. Here we are talking about, you know, adapting, you know, your uh, way of working practices to your environment, uh, meaning environment, the soil, the climate, what you need to produce, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that policymakers have, have the, 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 the full answer. You have also, uh, you have to innovate. Uh, what we need to do is to help you provide the knowledge transfer, provide funding for investing, provide incentives, helping you to de-risk the transition. What else can we do? And then work together. Okay, well, more, more on that, as you say, um, by the end of the year, I guess, when, when talk on the new CAP goes up a gear. So the gentleman just behind you now with the, with the specs, uh, just take the floor there. And uh, Marco, hi, I didn't recognise you. Yeah, ciao. Marco Contiero, um, Greenpeace, please take the yeah, floor. My mic is not working. It's working. Is it? Sorry. Um, good morning. I wanted to start by thanking Eva, uh, because you mentioned crop rotation as one of the examples of science-based uh, um, farming. We've been campaigning for 15 years to ensure that the CAP mentions crop rotations as part of the conditionality requirements. So we are getting somewhere and that's very good. Um, my question is related to the accidents in France. Uh, water basins being built with taxpayers' money uh, for the benefit of a very little proportion of farmers. 5% says the uh, um, uh, uh, experts involved in the, in the protests. Um, can we, how can we get to support solutions that instead of benefiting a very small part of farmers to the detriment of the vast majority of farmers uh, and, and how can we get solutions that get into the real problem in this case water basins are, are being used to uh, give waters to cereal producers mainly maize producers in that region maize that goes into feed that goes into industrial livestock farming is it possible to tackle that and to try to do what Tim has just said, taking a societal point of view and provide solutions and use public money to help all farmers to provide sustainable products. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Marco, for that. Um, if you don't mind passing the microphone to that, the gentleman just behind you, and then we'll come back in response to that question, Marco, in one moment. Please ask your question, and then we'll go back to the panel to respond, okay? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is Max Schulman. I'm a farmer from Finland. Just going to ask one question. I mean, all of you have mentioned technology in your brief five minutes. Now I would like to ask, how do you see that technology will play? What kind of a role will it play when we are looking at building a more resilient agricultural and food system? And then the second part of it, since we have there panelists from also outside EU, I would like to hear a little bit the ideas from intra, but also outside. Is actually Europe moving the right way with uptake of technology? Okay, thank you for that, Max. Um, okay, I'll go to Shari and uh, Tim first, and we'll come back to Catherine in response to Marco's question, okay? So who'd like to respond there on the technology transfer and the role of technology? Um, either Tim or Shari? I'll jump in. Uh, both as a farmer and at Farm Foundation, technology and innovation is core to our future and our success. At our own farm level, we are continuing to integrate it, but it comes back to that complexity of implementation. We had a rule that we could only implement three innovations at any one time in our farming operation just because we couldn't manage more than that. And yet there are more that we want to integrate into our farming operation. But it's that complexity of implementation that is critical. But technology and innovation is core to our future. Also at Farm Foundation, it's one of our four pillars of our work is looking at digital ag. Digital ag is the future of agriculture. Um, so we're working at how do we solve for that. There are still pain points for implementation across the sector and Farm Foundation is working on that uh, through data interoperability, for example. Okay, Shari, Tim, Professor Tim Benton. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, well, of course we need 
technolo technological innovation and there's a hell of a lot of stuff out there that can make our lives better and Renia will we'll talk about some of that this afternoon. Um, and uh, your question about is Europe moving, I mean the UK has just deregulated CRISPR-Cas9 uh, this week and uh, we're just waiting to see how people respond to that. I think there is an important link to Marcus's question, technology for whom? And the whole kind of GM debate from my perspective uh, was riven by uh, issues to do with power and who benefits from it as opposed to whether or not it's really, so it's a food sovereignty issue really, uh, rather than whether or not it is in an individual citizen's consumer basis. And I think to Marcus's question, we need, uh, we need to build public goods back into the market because they have been stripped out over the last 30 years and we need to get better at doing things for the common good and how that would have to be done in each country and jurisdiction it is important. And then to just finalise, we need innovation in technology, but we need innovation in governance and innovation in institutional structures. And we need to get better at thinking about how to do all of this and not just rely on unicorn technologies and a plethora of silver bullets, some of which will be very useful, but some of them will be reflect incumbent interests more than social goods. And I think we have to keep our eye firmly on social goods for the next generation and our current generation, particularly the smaller uh, institutions, smaller farmers uh, and the impoverished. Thank you, Tim. Catherine, uh, to come back to Marco Contiero's uh, question on water basins in France, if you don't mind responding to that. No, I don't mind. Just maybe uh, um, since I have the floor, just to say a couple of words also about technology and innovation. Yes, indeed, we, we need that and we need a, a policy environment that enables, uh, you know, that enables the, this, uh, this technology and this innovation, but at the service of sustainability. That's very important. And maybe sometimes, you know, in our uh, in the, the overall, um, let's say, research and innovation environment of our food systems, uh, this was a bit, you know, we lost sight of the importance of having uh, the technology and the innovation at the service. And I need to, we, we need to refocus uh, on that. I'm thinking about that, for example, in the context of uh, the um, upcoming legislation we are preparing on new genomic techniques where we think, you know, new breeding technique, uh, you know, these new plants, uh, we should continue, for example, to develop, you know, uh, new plants that helps uh, farmers, you know, uh, in terms of sustainability. Um, your comments, Mr. Contiero, was about the um, access to water, right? Access to wa water. Yeah, what I find here, not commenting on the on this particular event, but maybe looking also at at the, the broader picture to see that uh, to say that uh, changing is not easy. Um, <laughs> No, I think we have to say it, you know, in our life, we know that, you know, you know what you have, that may not be perfect, but changing is not easy. And transition is not something easy. You may have the solutions, the fact, the sense of emergency, but changing is not easy. And as I was saying, you take risks, of course, for the better, but you know, there is a period where it's complicated. And that's where we are. Uh, we are all struggling with how are we going to be able to change quickly uh, so that we go for the better, you know. Um, and I, I see here and there the situation also in the, the, the Netherlands that we've seen, you know. Um, it's, it's important that we take into account the fact that we, we need a, a shift, a profound change of our food systems and in particular of our farming systems. But we need to do that with farmers, not against farmers. So we have also to build, you know, the social acceptability of this transition. And that's where a conversation with, with everybody is, is important. Uh, it's, it's also helping and supporting uh, so that we don't end up with the fact that everybody recognizes that we have to change, but we can't do it because those who have to change don't do it for for the reasons you know that they 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 feel they have they are not supported that they, this is too risky you know 
And, and again, um, when it comes to water, we see that already uh, farmers are struggling with access to water and this creates conflict and so on and so forth. So we need to have everybody around the table and discuss that. So it's, it's not just, you know, um, uh, at, at EU level also, it needs to be done at, at local level, at national level and then at EU level. But we need to make sure that we do that with the people, not against the people. Thank you for that, Catherine. We're going to have to leave it there, ladies and gentlemen. So I would like to thank my panellists for this, this lively and interesting debate that covered a lot of ground, I think, in about 55 or 60 minutes. So my thanks indeed to Catherine Gisela-Laniel, Sherry Rugga, Fiddler, Professor Tim Benton and Eva Weber, and all of you, of course, for taking part. So a very warm round of applause for my speakers. I would now invite you to take return to your seats and invite my next set of panelists up for uh, to take the hot seat. So thank you very much to all. Bye bye.